Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Miroslav Volf was born in Croatia and raised in Serbia. As a high school student growing up in a marginalised community, he found himself having to explain why Christian faith makes sense. This was the beginning of his journey as a theologian. Miroslav Volf has written or edited 15 books and over 70 scholarly articles. He offers embrace as a theological response to exclusion. He explores the Trinitarian nature of Christian community and Christian responses to Islam and shows the ways that Christians can serve the common good. An internationally acclaimed theologian, he founded the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Here's Love Wolf, welcome to the Global Church Project. You say if the gospel is to be a healing word today, then Christian theology must address the hatred of the other. How can we go about doing that? Well, we live in the world in which hatreds are being stoked. And also we live in the world in which indifference is being mm -hmm. practiced as well. And on the one hand, we need to overcome hatreds. And on the other hand, we need mm -hmm. to overcome indifference and the healing for both the hatred and mm. indifference is actual engagement with the other as the one who has been created in God's image, as mm. the one for whom Christ mm. has died, as the one who has been called and destined mm. for the eternal glory of the world of love. Uh, and I think when we situate the other person in this grand story and narrative of God with mm -hmm. humanity, uh, we can begin to overcome um, the hatreds uh, and our indifferences and embrace the other. Mm. How do you think the metaphor of salvation as reconciliation moves us from exclusion to embrace? Re reconciliation obviously is the central uh, the, the central metaphor um, and it has to do with the overcoming of enmity and coming to fellowship of those who have been uh, estranged and in some ways uh, I, I'd almost like put it the other way around I have uh, thought of um, image of embrace as kind of filling out <laughs> what reconciliation ends up uh, being and in a sense taking it even a step further into the reconciled existence and embrace uh, is opening oneself for another even another who has uh, injured me inviting that other person uh, in but also inviting that other person to embrace me. Um, you can't have a one-sided embrace, all right? You, um, but embrace, by very definition, is a kind of a mutual uh, thing. Mm. And I think it symbolizes also in, in a very, very vivid way that uh, reconciliation presumes that the peace has been established, but the integrity of the other person uh, their being themselves remains. Mm. Reconciliation is not absorption of another mm. person into oneself. And embrace symbolizes that because it's not just that embrace is mutual and then you close the arms around the other and other around you, but you let the other go because you can't have an mm. internal embrace, right, in that <laughs> sense. It, it defeats itself and so mm. it symbolizes the other belonging uh, to me, continuing to live as part of my, my own uh, existence, but the other being uh, himself or herself uh, also. And that's what this reconciled existence is. We're together, but we're together with respecting each other's integrity. How does divine self-giving compel us to embrace others the way in which God has embraced us? D -d divine self-giving, I think, is as the first epistle uh, of John tell us expression of the reality that God not only loves, but that God in fact is love. The very character of God's being is love, and therefore the very character of God's coming out of God's self toward the world is an act of love, and therefore that which constitutes us 
as human beings is act of divine love. Mm. So divine self-giving is not simply, so to speak, a, a kind of description of God and uh, the, with the statement, well, now you do what God has done, mm. but it actually is that which constitutes our very existence. So when we do as God has done, mm. we are in fact resonating with the character of our own life. God has created us out of love and for love. When we open ourselves for others, we enact the truth of our existence rather than somehow alienating ourselves from ourselves by doing this very hard thing of loving other people. I want to ask you a question about remembering rightly. You say that in a world of atrocities and abuses, remembering wrongly perpetuates mm. damage and remembering rightly can lead towards healing. Why is that so and how do we remember rightly? Well, so, so for me, the whole idea of memory is very, it's very interesting in, in one regard, because sometimes we think of memories as just uh, knowing what happened in the past. We remember it, well, phone number or something like that, uh, which we knew somewhere and now we recall what him or date uh, from some historical event that has uh, happened. And memory for us has to do then simply with facts. But if you look carefully at memory, how it functions, it has this pragmatic side to it. We always do something with our memories. Now that becomes a really important thing in situation of uh, injury, of violence, because remembering wrongly means we remember in the ways that we let mm. those memories fester in us. They occupy our entire identity they create resentment in us, they project hatreds on the outside, they create insecurities, and all the event that has happened has in turn been internalized with the help of memory, recurs there and, and actually disturbs the very character of, of our lives and often leads us to perpetuate violence. That means to remember wrongly. To remember rightly means to remember, of course truthfully, but remember in such a way that we frame the memories of what has happened uh, with the view of our own transformation and reconciliation uh, in the future. And for me, I, I think the central, what, what I call sometimes meta-memory, that is to say memory which regulates how we remember, <laughs> is the memory of the cross and resurrection, which is to say memory of salvation. Just like for Israel, memory of Exodus was a meta-memory through which they remembered uh, and re related to their own uh, situations of enmity. So also for Christians, it's the memory of the cross of Christ that heals mm -hmm. our memories. We remember at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. And at the foot of the cross, we remember in such a way that memories become not swords with which we fight, but bridges through which we, over which we come to another person. How do we help local congregations practice disciplines that help them to remember rightly? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a crucial, uh, the word disciplines mm. is, is a crucial one uh, um, because it, you need to kind of learn to mm. remember rightly. And we know how difficult it is uh, for an injured person or even for a person who has committed injury somehow to free himself or herself from this uh, recursive, uh, repeated, almost obsessive character of memories that um, dominate one's own uh, life. And I think there are disciplines then that we have to, that we have to practice, that we have to uh, tell and I think for us, for me, the, the most important, uh, 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 there are many elements, but uh, one of the most important is to remember in a hopeful way. To remember uh, and with a, with, with a recognition that that which I have done or that which somebody else has done to me doesn't define fully that I am. I am not what I have done or what I have suffered. And it's only when I recognize that I am what God sees me to be and uh, that I gain freedom from the past 
It's almost like a dead hand of the past that's holding me back. I get freedom so I can come into the promised uh, future. So the word of promise, gospel is the word of promise that opens up the possibilities that my past seems to close uh, for me. So that would be one way in which we can, we can practice seeing ourselves as those defined by who God sees us to be, mm -hmm. seeing our future as not being determined by the past, but being opened up by the word of uh, promise. And we can go on and explore mm -hmm. this kind of rich texture of attitudes, self-perceptions, practices that open up the space for us mm -hmm. to remember in a reconciling way, to live reconciled mm -hmm. lives. There's much discussion today about how the church might seek and pursue a public faith. And maybe we'll begin somewhere in what's negative about the church's practice today. So how do you think the church has malfunctioned in the public space today? And how do we go about countering some of those malfunctions? Yeah, um, I think there are number of different, uh, I think, mal malfunctions, but I have identified, especially in, in my book, A Public Faith, I've identified two major ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those malfunctions is the coerciveness of faith. When faith, mm -hmm. somehow, when we as Christians think that we have to, and are called to impose our lives, our, our views and positions mm -hmm. on others. And this is kind of the temptation of the Christendom account of Christianity, where we want to regulate the entire public space and push everybody out who disagree uh, from us. Then the other, almost like an opposite uh, malfunction of faith, is when faith uh, sees it, ceases to be engaged with public domain, becomes almost like a small sectarian club uh, or becomes privatized, reduced to my private feelings or our communal morality, but somehow doesn't shape in a significant way uh, the entirety of our lives. Our workspace then becomes a, a, a secular space and our home space is, uh, a, let's say, a Christian space. And this kind of separation uh, is, uh, is uh, what I call the idleness of faith. Faith isn't active where it's supposed to be, uh, in the entirety of the space where it's supposed to be active. And often I think one kind of conditions, uh, uh, conditions the other, right? We try to impose, when we don't succeed, we mm. retreat, and then from retreat mm. we, we try to, uh, to again, uh, this imposition. I think we find, need, need to find the middle, and there is a, a very happy middle. We mm. never ought to impose. Uh, our faith, but we ought to be publicly, actively engaged, and not in a way in which we seek simply to transform the entirety of the society, in, in my judgment, but some things can be celebrated that are uh, happening outside by other people of other faiths or people uh, of no faith at all. Other things we simply have to withdraw from, and yet there are other things where we can we, we can transform. But in all of these, we are governed by our commitment to Jesus Christ uh, and by our commitment to serve others as Christ has served them. What do you think Christians should concern themselves with when it comes to living well in the world today? I, I think we as Christians have often uh, tended to kind of limit our concerns in about living the world well to kind of particular issues. We have majored in issues and those issues end up being almost like a signature markers of who we are uh, as Christians. Um, I don't want necessarily to kind of disagree the, about the importance of such issues, whether that's abortion or gay marriage or whatever that might, might, that might be. My sense would be simply for us to kind of expand the vision and ask ourselves uh, what is the account of the good life that we stand for in the world, in our individual lives, in our communities, but also in the world. I think that people today are hungry for meaningful, thought through, reflected uh, existence. They often find themselves squeezed, pressures, pressured by many different, uh, many different demands upon them, uh, by kind of the attractions of consumerism, uh, mm -hmm. and the, the, the life in the world ends up being this very uh, 
kind of a, maybe uh, some people talk uh, talk about a lightness of the existence of lack of meaning uh, arbitrariness mm -hmm. we don't know how to really live live well and there's a huge hunger um, mm -hmm. at the college level um, later when people people go into their workforce and I think we are not sufficiently providing that uh, for people so we have, have we have at Yale uh, a project about um, I, I've entitled it God and Human Flourishing or right now I can call it Christ and the Good Life. Yeah. What are the different dimensions of the good life from the way we dress, from the way we eat our food, for the way in which, which we engage in sexual activity, mm. to the way we celebrate, to the way we are born, to the way we die. There are different dimensions of our existence mm. and Christ is bearing upon all of them. And the witness of faith is a witness of a kind of well-lived life, the motivated rightly uh, and moving in the right mm -hmm. direction. How does faith animate life, uniting meaning with pleasure mm -hmm. and resulting in true joy? Yeah, that's a big uh, that's a big question, and I think for me one of the central central concerns because on the one hand we have a um, uh, people who want to kind of impose strict order upon life mm. and that strict order upon life gives the meaning and kind of weight mm. to life. On the other hand, people flee from that order into kind of arbitrariness of doing whatever I want to, want to do uh, and kind of trying to escape the crushing character of, the, of, of, of a quote-unquote ordered mm. life. Uh, and uh, trying to experience freedom and freedom often in pleasure. And I think w what we need to look for ways, and Christian faith provides, uh, uh, I think, the beautiful way in which we can overcome this dichotomy between meaning and, uh, and, and pleasure. And I think um, much can be said about it, but one important thing for me is that, um, that, that, that when we experience the world as a whole, when we experience individual things in the world, whether that's a meal uh, or a conversation or um, uh, a walk through the, through the woods, uh, whatever that might be, when we experience that uh, as a gift of God, I think it gives depth of meaning and depth to a pleasure. Uh, of our lives, you know, I use the example in the in the new book that I've just about uh, to be released uh, called Flourishing. I use the example of my father's uh, gold nibbed pen, Pelican gold nibbed pen, mm -hmm. which uh, he has given uh, to me. And when I use this pen, obviously I can use it, but forgetting that it was uh, my father's gift. But then why would be foolish to just have this? Uh, this uh, this um, object that's beautiful in its own right, but not remember that it's a gift from my father. When I remember that it's a gift from my father, suddenly there is kind of a depth of pleasure to this. Every time I take it, it has a meaning. It's not just the pleasure in the object, it's a pleasure in whole set of relationship and it gives a depth of meaning. Something similar happens, I think, when we discover the world as a gift to us uh, from, from God, mm. then we can enjoy it uh, in a much deeper way. Mm. Sometimes it seems like Christians behave as though they can pursue human flourishing in isolation. But what does it mean to pursue human flourishing in relationship to other faiths mm. and to states? Yeah, I, th I think, um, uh, I think we, we live in pluralistic societies. We live in societies in which various um, conceptions of the good life uh, or practices associated with good life vie for, for our attention. And I think we have to learn to understand how to live in the world. Somehow we have to figure out a way in which we deal with this, with this uh, plurality. Some people want to simply isolate themselves from others. <laughs> And uh, or other people simply say, well, you know, it doesn't matter which you choose, whatever kind of fits your interest. Uh, it's like, uh, like you've got you've got here a kind of ice cream shop, and there are these uh, fifteen or twenty different sorts of ice cream. Uh, which one should you combine? Want, want you to combine uh, together? Do whatever you want, and tomorrow you come, it's going to be a different combination, <laughs> right? And it seems like we 
we try to uh, live the, our general direction of our lives the way we make consumer uh, choices as a matter matters of uh, of taste. I think neither one of these will will actually actually do. Uh, we live. Uh, together with others, we have common life uh, with others, and I think together with others we have to struggle for the shape of that uh, of that common uh, common life. Mm. And I think we have things to learn from others. We have things to impart to others. Uh, and my sense is that uh, Christ is the key, the key to human mm. existence. But Christ's wisdom isn't just limited. To what we read in the Bible, or even what we, or even less what we hear in the church, Christ's mm. wisdom is wisdom in the entirety of what is wise. Is Christ's wisdom entirety of what is true? Is Christ's truth? And often we can learn a lot uh, mm. about what is true and mm. good. And if it resonates with the image and picture of Christ, we can do a mm. great deal of uh, learning. And I think this kind of learning uh, in common conversation with others is what we're called mm. uh, to do while at the same time affirming deep mm. conviction that Christ is the key mm. to human flourishing. Recently you've written about Muslim Christian relations. How do you think that Christian ideas of the Trinity compare with Muslim ideas of Allah? Well Christians are Trinitarians, uh, Muslims mm. aren't. <laughs> And that's a very significant uh, and important difference mm -hmm. between Christian account of who God is and Muslim account uh, of who God is. Um, uh, the kind of foundational difference um, uh, often uh, I think can be expressed with this idea that I think I woke earlier, which was that God in the Christian account mm -hmm. is love, for God to be love, not just to love, uh, means that from eternity to eternity God is, and was, and will be and love, which is to say that God is in some way a Trinitarian community uh, for Christians, whereas Muslims have a very much a unitary uh, understanding of God. Now you might say when you put it this way that we're actually talking about two different gods, images of God, right? Mm -hmm. One is a Trinitarian and one is a, a Unitarian, and they can't have anything to do with one another, except that the Jews don't believe in Trinitarian God, and yet we as Christians cannot mm. but say that we worship the same God mm. as the Jews do, even though their understanding of God mm. is a mon strictly monotheistic Unitarian understanding uh, of God. Nonetheless, there are very significant overlaps between what Christians and Jews believe about God. Significant differences, but significant overlaps. I believe that we need to emphasize both and make discerning judgments about differences and overlaps. And I think there are significant overlaps in Christian and Muslim understanding of God, notwithstanding important uh, differences. Mm. What do you think a new pluralism looks like, where Christians and Muslims together can pursue peace and also explore the contours of the good life? Yeah, I, I think it's very important to... I, I, I talk um, about... Uh, I've coined a phrase um, which is a little, little bit maybe cumbersome, but, but it uh, expresses things, I think, uh, rightly. Mm -hmm. And that's contending particular universalisms. We live in a situation of contending particular universalism. By universalism I mean now not belief about who is going to be saved, whether everybody mm -hmm. or only some, but universalism I mean the worldviews which claim that they're true for all human beings, that they're universally true rather than for some human beings. There are folks who think of pluralism as one religion, Islam, is true for Muslims, uh, Christianity is true for Christians, Buddhism is true for Buddhists. I consider this kind of pluralism as irresponsible. Uh, I think both Islam, Christ, uh, all, uh, all these religions claim to be true for all human beings. Now, but they all make their claims, therefore they contend with one another, because obviously 
they're, di they're different and they can't be all in all respects uh, true, right? And so in many ways they're kind of particular because embraced by particular people uh, from certain vantage point expressed make claims that are true for everyone and they contend with one another. That's our situation. That's our situation with Islam, that's our situation with Judaism, that's our situation with, with Buddhism, each in different different way, right? And I think uh, we need to find ways to live in, in the common space in such a way that we are true to the truth claims that our faith tradition gives, while at the same time being able to converse with people who think very differently than we do. We need to have a political arrangements where each person has an equal voice uh, and freedom to express their position. We need to have educational uh, institutions which allow for these kinds of conversations to happen. We need to have cultural sensibilities and nurture cultural sensibilities where we can have a robust discussion while at the same time um, being able to live together uh, in peace. I think that's the kind of pluralism that we need. Not cheap pluralism of anything goes. It's actually contentious pluralism that mutually respects each other's view while contending for their truth. Much has been written today about the church's mission in a post-Christendom, post-modern, multicultural context. Now whatever you think about those terms how would you define the mission of the church and how does the church pursue that mission today? I'm very simple-minded about <laughs> this, right? If you, uh, the, 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 I've described kind of the context and, and a kind of framework in which, uh, in which we live, this contending particular universalisms uh, and the kind of struggle for truth. Uh, in, in the context of embraced pluralism, right? So, so I embrace it as a project, even though I contend uh, for it from my own pers particular perspective. Now once you, once you have this kind of framework on, and I, can, I think I can defend very well on Christian grounds this, this framework, then my position in terms of witness is, is a very simple one. Um, I was just recently in uh, a Colmar in uh, France, uh, and saw the uh, Isaheimer uh, altarpiece. And Karl Barth was famous by saying that the goal of a theologian, goal of the preacher, is the same as uh, uh, is, is, can be expressed with the image of John the Baptist on this uh, beautiful altarpiece uh, from Isenheim. And this is, you have John the Baptist with his fingers kind of pointed out uh, toward uh, Jesus Christ. The entire goal of the church, entire nature of the church and its mission is expressed in this finger. It's not about us. It's not about Christianity. It's not about anything that we have to offer. It's all about who Jesus Christ is. Christ is the key to humanity. Christ is the one for whom the whole creation has been created. Christ is the one uh, who, uh, who, who is coming uh, in glory. All the mission of the church is a mission about Jesus Christ. And so um, bearing witness, and so it's very interesting how weak that finger is, right? It's not finger here, it's not finger <laughs> pointed like this. Yeah. It's finger pointed toward the crucified. It's an amazingly beautiful image. It's everything about the witness away from one, oneself, nothing about the power, everything about the power mm. of the one whose power is very much different than the power of the world. Mm. When people make comment about your work, what is most misunderstood? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, well, I think the, the book that has been most misunderstood uh, is the book on, uh, that I wrote on Allah, a Christian mm. response. Um, uh, I, I think that the most uh, egregious kind of misunderstanding of the book uh, was, uh, I think somebody wrote that I was advocating something like Chris Lam, right? <laughs> some kind of combination of Christianity and Islam because I have made a claim that Muslims and Christians 
uh, worship the same God. Differently understood, but nonetheless the same quote-unquote object that they worship. And then notwithstanding the fact that I describe myself and argue in that book uh, fully for a robust orthodox account of, of the Trinity, notwithstanding the fact that I am a Chalcedonian uh, Christian, that I believe uh, in two natures, uh, in one person of, of Jesus Christ, um, and uh, nonetheless people feel very much that, uh, that there's some kind of betrayal of faith that, that's going on. Um, you know, it's, and I, I think that some of this misunderstanding, that misunderstanding, and there, there was a kind of similar misunderstanding of the exclusion and the embrace book, mm. but more the, at a social level. Um, I, in a sense that I wrote the book for the conflict situation in former Yugoslavia. Um, I'm a Croatian. Mm. Um, it, it was, who's grown up in, in Serbia. These two groups were uh, contending mm. with one another. And, and the book has been misunderstood by both. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like a fallen between, it's almost like, a, like there are these two chairs and I sat straight in the middle between them, right? <laughs> I have the similar feeling with Allah, right? Yeah. That I sat between the, uh, between the chairs. But I think the chairs are wrongly placed. <laughs> People think that they're sitting on those, the, those chairs, so that's where chairs are. Uh, and and they, have, they have kind of crafted a positions that they think are opposed, but in fact aren't. Mm. And I'm hopeful that uh, just as it was the case with exclusion and embrace, then now mm. suddenly when there's a little bit less of contention, people can see the overlaps, people mm. can see how while remaining Croats and while remaining Serbians, they can still live with one another, right? And because they have overlapping, not just interests, but overlapping convictions, right? I think the same is true uh, with, with Islam and Christianity. We can be and ought to be Christians in the full sense of the word. We ought to bear witness to Christ, to every human being, include, including, is, uh, including Islam. But there's absolutely no reason why we can't recognize, and not just recognize, but celebrate it, the good that is there in the Muslim tradition, and indeed help Muslims call uh, their own wayward followers back to uh, whatever might be construed or as an authentic form mm. of Islam. If you're only able to give one exaltation to the church today, what would be the final thing that you'd want to say to them? I'd repeat, Jesus Christ is the reason I, why I am a Christian. Jesus Christ is the reason why church is a church. Jesus Christ is the reason why I believe the church, to the extent that it follows Christ, will have a future. Here's Love Val. Thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Thank you. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities, and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.